Hey guys, it's Ollie. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. So today, as requested, we will be talking about seasonal behaviors in snails. This is a bit of a longer one, so I will add a table of contents in the description below. But to summarize, we'll be talking about hibernation, estivation, and why they might do those things as well that don't contribute to weather, just as a keeper kind of knowledge. If you keep pet snails, it might be important for you to know. And I did my best to include some examples. All of my links uh, for where I got this information will also be linked in the description down below. Just a disclaimer is that I am in no means an expert. I study snails and keep snails as a hobby. Also, please just stick around for this really quick. It's a very, very fast announcement. I will be at NARBC Tinley Park this year, October 7th and 8th. So if you happen to be going to Tinley Park this year, and you happen to see me, please come say hi. I am t bringing these little glow-in-the-dark perler snails to hand out to anyone who might recognize me if that happens just, just because there's little snails. So if you do see me and you do want one of those, please come say hi, be part of my vlog. It'll be awesome to meet some of you guys. But anyway, back to the video. So there are basically two main occurrences that can cause dormancy in snails, which is dryness and the cold. So most snails move mostly in the night or really early in the morning. This is because these times are a lot more cool and humid. Snails use their mucus, which is like that slimy substance that comes off of them. This mucus keeps the snail from drying out, but also makes it a lot easier for the snail to move around. So it's super important, but it's also a lot easier to maintain that whenever there's already humidity in the air. So let's go into our first extreme, which is the cold. What do they do in the cold is that they hibernate. You may know this term from mammals. Mammals will hibernate pretty often, such as bears. It is mostly a state where the animal will conserve their energy over winter. We'll talk more about that, uh, specifically in snails now. Most snails cannot easily survive the winter, and many slugs actually die in the winter after laying their eggs. But many species of snails will hibernate, or otherwise known as snail sleep. Snail sleep is a type of hibernation where the snail will slow down almost all of his activity. It may even remain motionless for days or weeks at a time. It goes so far as people thinking that their pet snail is dead whenever it is hibernating. The easiest way for you to tell the difference between a hibernating, estivating, or dead snail is that dead snails will usually have a fishy odor to them. They do not smell very good. So if you are suspecting your snail may have died, give it a smell. Just be prepared for that really bad smell. Now, most of the time, this is due to the winter. However, there are some other causes in their husbandry or care that can cause them to hibernate or estivate. We will talk more about that later after we've gone through hibernation and estivation. Uh, once again, table of contents are in the description below, so don't be afraid to use that to your advantage. Seasonal hibernation only affects the snails that are native to weather-changing locations. The most well-known examples are the helix species, such as aspersums, pomadias, and molars. These are your common garden snails. With the onset of cold weather, snails will fall into a state of suspended animation. The snail's activity is reduced to where only the extremely important functions remain and even the heartbeat will slow down rapidly. The duration of a snail's hibernation is usually between four and six months. It usually starts between the middle of October and the beginning of November. As soon as the air temperature starts falling below 12 to 15 degrees Celsius, or 53 to 59 degrees Fahrenheit. A good example of hibernation is actually the Helix pomadia, also known as the Roman snails or the grape snail. They have a pretty advanced form of hibernation. Pomadias will dig a hole in the ground which additionally has moss. They close the shell aperture with a lid and retreat into its shell. The resulting air cushions isolate them further against the cold. One really good example of a snail that will not hibernate are glass snails. Glass snails are carnivorous and feed on other snails. So when snails are hibernating, that is usually a good time for the glass snail to go hunting. The interesting thing is that the cold doesn't really seem to affect the glass snail. They've even been seen crawling across the snow in search of food. Now let's talk about how they come out of hibernation. When it heats up, the snail will unseal and quickly make its way to the surface. They do have to race against the melting snow though, and they risk drowning. During hibernation, the snail will lose about 10% of its body weight, but it will gain that back within the next couple of days, being the most ferocious eaters you will ever see. 
I also found this little bit of research and I couldn't quite figure out where to fit it in. So I'm just going to put it here and I will be reading a direct quote. So according to the Living World of Mollusks website, which is a website I highly recommend, they have a lot of really, really good information. Large snails and slugs can make seasonal movements, example Lloyd 1967, perhaps traveling several meters to congregate on a rotten tree snag and then dispersing again. One eastern species, the broad-banded forest snail, also known as Alagona profunda, exhibited homing behavior in an Illinois study. It moved to a winter hibernation spot and returned in springtime to an area of fragmented log mold. Blinn, 1963. All right, now hibernation is out of the way. That is basically the process. Once again, this does depend on your species of snail, but most snails will hibernate the same. Uh, estivation is a little bit more interesting. They do have some different methods, so let's go ahead and jump into estivation. During hot and dry days, snails will enter a state of estivation, also known as dryness sleep. Estivation is the slowing of activity in the summertime, especially the slowing down of metabolism. It is, in very simple terms, the heat equivalent to hibernation. Now, like I mentioned earlier, snails will estivate in very different ways, depending on their species. But what they all nearly have in common is that they close their shell mouth with a membrane of dried mucus after settling into a shady hidey spot. There is, of course, an exception. This exception is the door snail. Door snails do not need a membrane. Like their name alludes to, their shell has a closing apparatus with a small shell plate that closes like a door. Now there are also snails that will remain outside of a hidey hole, and these snails can often be recognized by their brightly colored shell. These bright shells will reflect the sunlight and minimize evaporation. Other snails have adapted even better to the sunlight and dryness, such as heath snails and zebra snails, which are both a heat-loving species. They possess a whitish shell with dark bands, and on warm days, old bushes full of these snails can be seen hanging and estivating. Other snails will hide in the ground when estivating like pomadias, which will dig under the ground in dry weather or will hide in dense vegetation. A couple of different examples for different types of estivation could be the Corsican snail, which may even dig as deep as 60 centimeters or 23.62 inches. And the Sicilian snail has a very unique way of estivating. This snail can make its mucus acidic and will etch holes into the limestone rock that it lives on so that it can go hide in the heat and the dryness while also being protected against predators. So now that we've gone over hibernation and estivation, let's talk about the reasons that this may be happening in your enclosure without weather issues. Hibernation and estivation are both methods of survival for the snail to survive those harsh environments. However, it can also protect them against improper husbandry or care. These conditions can include low humidity or lack of water, poor or not enough nutrition, dryness, heat, coldness, stress, and disease. So what should you do if you are finding these issues with your snail? First thing you're going to want to do is try to identify the cause and fix it as soon as possible. The snail should return to normal as long as this hasn't been going on for too long if the correct conditions are applied. Again, you have to be super careful because if you don't know the snail that you are keeping, this could be a cause. So if you have sort of a mystery species, you may have to play around a little bit with your husbandry. So for food and water, it's a super easy fix. Just make sure that you are misting your snails enough for that humidity. Um, the best way is to try to get some of those droplets on the side of the enclosure. The snails really like to drink from those. Be careful if you have a garden snail with providing a dish of water um, because since they're so small, their breathing holes are so close to the ground and they can very easily drown in water. So for food, you're not only going to want to make sure they're getting enough food, but also make sure they're getting the right kind of food. So you're going to want to make sure that they are getting those nice leafy greens and those really vitamin packed foods as well as the correct amount of protein and calcium. I do have some videos all about diets. Um, I will put it here. I also have a video all about protein, which can be listed here as well. Also make sure that you are providing these items as often as needed. For the heat and the cold, once again, it's an easy fix. Just make sure you are providing heat if it does get too cold in your house or that you are providing um, some kind of way to cool down your enclosure if it gets too hot. I actually had a problem with this myself whenever I didn't realize that the heat could affect snails so badly, especially when that species was native to where I currently am. So unfortunately, I lost 
uh, all of my pet snails a couple of years ago. Uh, so just you're going to want to make sure that you are keeping an eye on the temperature of your enclosure. I do once again have those videos. I will put them up here. I'll put one of them there and then I'll put the next one like behind it because I don't think I can put two in one but there somewhere. So for stress, this might be a little confusing because you don't really think of snails as having a lot of stress. They can be kind of fragile. So stress for snails can be caused by fast drastic changes. So you're just going to want to make sure that you give them that time to acclimate. I know a lot of times this can be an issue with snails uh, with soil changes. You want to avoid changing, like fully changing your substrate like once a month like you would with a reptile. It's much better at the very most to do a one third change um, and just to spot clean because they, not, they need that beneficial bacteria. And if you suddenly take that away and there's this new substrate that does not have that bacteria and something they're not quite used to, uh, they can go into a kind of shock almost. So things like that, things like if you bring them home for the first time and you're going to want to spend a lot of time with them, but it can be better just to leave them be for just a, a few days until they acclimate. Some snails can be a little bit more freaked out than others, so just follow their lead, you know? The best you can do if you think that this is what's causing it, this would probably be the, one of the last things that you would look at to fix. Um, is just to give them time and keep a really good eye on them. And once again, keep a really good eye on the conditions of your enclosure and make sure that they are correct for your species. So now for diseases, this usually refers to breaks or damages in the shell or poisoning. I do have a video talking about shell damage. I will put it up here. I know I'm linking a ton of videos. If I run out of the amount I'm allowed, they'll be in the description below as well. So just refer to that one if that is a problem you are having. That's a pretty obvious thing. So um, if that's a problem, I have that video uh, for you to refer to. Now, as far as poisoning goes, I honestly don't really have a fix for this. I am unaware of any way to like unpoison a snail, to be honest with you. I tried to look it up. I couldn't really find anything. If you have something, please feel free to comment it down below. I'm sure that it would help someone out there, but I am currently unaware of any way to fix poisoning. The way that you would want to avoid uh, your snail being accidentally poisoned is to be really careful uh, about what you're putting in their enclosure. You don't want to put anything with super harsh chemicals. They will usually rasp or chew on things in their enclosure, so you want to be super careful about that. And you also want to be super careful about what you are feeding them and the amount of pesticides it might have on it. Definitely make sure you're trying to get produce or foods that don't have a lot of pesticides. Organic does not mean pesticide free. As far as my understanding goes, it does mean like a less or a less harmful pesticide. Uh, you can also sometimes get lucky and find some that are marketed as pesticide free. I know that's becoming a little bit more popular in grocery stores. And just make sure that you wash your produce really, really, really good. Of course, with plain water, don't you don't have to use soap because it's for a snail. You don't want them to ingest that either. And if you are able to peel it, peel it. Uh, just better safe than sorry. Uh, be careful about your hands. A lot of people do like to hold their snails. It can be bad for them for the amount of salt on your hands, but also, if you were messing with cleaners or you were messing with pesticides or anything like that and that's on your hands when you handle your snail, oftentimes when you're holding one, it will rasp or chew on your hand. So just be extra cautious. If you're unsure, like I kind of am, I usually use gloves to handle snails at this point unless I am for sure nothing's on my hands. It just makes me feel safer. So that is um, all I kind of have for you for that. I don't have a way to fix poisoning, but those are ways you can avoid poisoning. And that is pretty much all I have for you today. I really hope you found it helpful or at the very least entertaining. Give this video a like for the algorithm and comment down below if you think I missed anything, as well as any other snail video ideas that you might have for me. I would be happy to do anything you guys would really request from me. I am always open to hearing what you guys want to see from me, so please let me know in the comments below. All of my links, including my Instagram account, my art account, my Etsy shop that I share with my wife, and my Facebook group will be linked in the description down below, so please go check those out. And as always, don't forget to subscribe if you are into this kind of content or really any animal kind of content. I upload every single Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, but you can hit the bell if you don't want to remember that. And as always, I will see you guys next week. Bye!